Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the Brotherhood of Gaming. I'm William Morris. And you know, before time gets away with me, I felt like I really should talk about, uh, you know, the Streets of Rage series. I mean, after all, I did start something. I might as well finish it, right? Right? All right. So for the sake of making things easier on me, and mostly because I don't think that there's a whole lot I could say about Streets of Rage 2 to cover an entire video, I felt like it would probably be better if I just did the same thing and combined the videos of Streets of Rage 2 and 3 and made it into one big segment before we jumped into the next games in the series. So, without further ado, let's not waste any more time, lord knows I do that on a regular basis, and let's chalk bare knuckle. So if you saw my first review slash retrospective on the Streets of Rage series, by now you know it's pretty clear just how big this series eventually got among speed em up fans and Sega loyalists. The first game, while again not the greatest in a genre, was still pretty damn a good memorable experience. I mean, from Yuzo Koshiro's insane music that can make a grown man cry from nostalgia, to the simple story of vigilante cops going against a crime lord, to the simplistic good old fashioned gameplay where you get to whoop wholesale ass with a friend by your side, Sega's team of programmers just managed to fit all the right pieces where they needed to be, and thus Streets of Rage and or bare knuckle depending on your home region, was an instant classic. So sequels, as we know, were bound to happen. Streets of Rage 2, a little over a year after the first game, would be released by Christmas for North America, and surprisingly a little later in January for everywhere else. Yeah, it really was a different time, guys. I mean, in today's world, it can take practically a decade or so for a sequel to a game to get made. But you really gotta miss those days where it could be just a few months to a year at best, and then we'd have a new one. Ah, oh, good times. No, we didn't have the best graphics ever at the time, but what we did have was, plain and simply, fun. And holy shit, Streets of Rage 2 was not fucking around. This game kicked ass, and it made its name well known amongst gamers that to this day, Streets of Rage 2, my friends, specifically, is voted by many to be one of those BEST GAMES OF ALL TIME. Visually, the game got a complete overhaul and just looked bigger and better. From what I've heard, the dev team behind this game actually had to make some modifications to the Sega Genesis cartridges so that they could have more room and capacity to make this game look and play as good as it does. I mean, the characters are bigger, the environments are flashier, graphically from the beginning to end, Streets of Rage 2 is just nothing but eye candy and I can't get enough of it. I really don't feel like I need to continue singing this game's praises. In fact, just trying to find stuff to talk about when it comes to Streets of Rage 2 is kind of a challenge, because I'm sure you, yes you, the person watching this video, have already played it. You know why it's good. In fact, it's one of your favorite games, and you enjoy watching other people make videos about your favorite games, also liking those videos and subscribing in the hopes that they make more. You know, something to think about. So back on topic here, what is Streets of Rage 2 even about? Our heroes defeated Mr. X in the last game, or, you know, took over the whole thing if you were an asshole to play or two. So what's the plot? Well, as it turns out, our heroes aren't exactly the best assassins ever, because Mr. X somehow lived through the ordeal of the final battle in the last game and uh, returned to resume his evil reign with a good old helping of revenge! 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 Now we're cooking, huh? Off screen, Mr. X captures Adam, who, if you remember, was one of our heroes from the first game, and for some reason chooses to hold him hostage. I don't know why, why he doesn't just kill him and move on to the next couple, uh, whatever. Axel and Blaze are wise to Mr. X's scheme, and once again, take to the streets of rage to bring him down, and hopefully rescue Adam in the process. Fortunately, they won't be going alone, as now we have two new allies to play as. Yeah! Enter Max, a friend of Axel's who's a professional wrestler and a big boy to boot, also introducing Adam's younger brother, Skate. Can you guess what he does? Hey, it's the 90s. Okay, so one nice improvement over the original game already was the additional characters. Don't get me wrong, Adam was fine, but if you take the diversity out of the picture, Adam, Blaze, and Axel for the most part played pretty identically with only minor differences being in their attributes. And while attributes and character stats are still a thing in Streets of Rage 2, each character this time gameplay-wise actually feels different, and they each have their own identity. One of the biggest changes this time around was the additional powers each character has. In the first game, you had one special attack, which 
wasn't really even a special attack as much as it was calling up for a backup squad car who would just act as a screen nuke. Sadly, there's no squad car this time, but to make up for it, our heroes can do a combo-based power move and a couple of uh, extra special attacks that would become staples of the characters. Controller-wise, all of the moves are performed the same way for each character, so there really is no confusion on how to do them. But using Axel as the prime example here, you have your regular attack just by hammering the B button. Forward Forward B has Axel perform an uppercut with Axel shouting BARE KNUCKLE! The A button for specials has two functions. Pressing it itself will act as a crowd control attack, which can be useful for breaking out of enemy holds. And then there's the forward special, which has Axel, or whoever, just rain blows on who's unfortunate enough to stand in front of you. Interestingly, it's only the A button specials that have a cost. Like other beat em up games, to avoid spamming these super moves, they cost about one fifth of your health to activate. So naturally, they're only meant to be used for those go for broke circumstances or when you want to look cool finishing off a boss. However, the forward forward attack has no cost at all and can be spammed indefinitely. And in my opinion, it's pretty powerful on its own. Hell, I would go as far to say it's really the only special move you need. Like I said, all four characters can perform their own special moves with the same inputs. Now here's where the statistics come into play. Blaze is the most balanced across the board, with Axel once again not being really good with jump time, but being better with his overall technique. Max definitely takes Adam's place as the powerhouse of the group, but also being the slowest. And then there's Skate. Not winning any awards in the power department, but he is the quickest one of the bunch thanks to his rollerblades, making it easier to zip around the field. Now, there's a side of me that does question why two very professionally trained ex-cops would allow a wrestler and their partner's kid brother join in on a very dangerous frontal assault on a crime lord, but eh, they gotta make a video game. With all that being said, the game plays like a good beat-em-up should. You have eight stages, like before, and each one is a thrill. The first stage reintroduced us to the city streets, in my opinion, ultimately to keep things familiar. From there, you make your way to the city bridge, Disneyland, yeah, I don't care what you say, I mean, just look at it, look at it, that's the castle. From there, you go to an alien funhouse of some kind, a ship, a baseball field that turns into an underground wrestling ring, a scientific facility on a tropical military zone, okay, and lastly, the headquarters of Mr. X himself. Of course, the stages are filled to the brim with enemies, and for the most part, they look largely the same as I would expect, albeit graphically enhanced a bit. They all, for the most part, function as they did in the original game, with not much added to their moves. And personally, I thought they worked fine in the original, so I'm glad Sega team really didn't feel the need to reinvent the wheel here. Still, they did add some new enemies to the roster, and some new bosses as well. Ay, the most annoying ones I feel that are worth of note is this asshat in the jetpack. Ugh, he is constantly in the air, well out of reach, and likes to swoop down fast for some cheap shots. <laughs> Thankfully, spamming the bare knuckle move leaves Axel with some invincibility frames, making it easy for me to get the jump on him. Yeah, haha, I can cheat too, you bastard. Oy, the other enemy I'm not a fan of is this Blanca Wolverine guy. He, at least for me, is a little tough to get a read on. He's fast, he's got reach, he can grab you, he can drain your health quickly, and ugh, this guy's just a pain in the ass. Come on, motherfucker! God damn it! Come on, you piece of shit! Yeah, got him! Ugh. Oh, yeah, that's another thing I love about this game. Oh, the punching sound effects. I don't know what it is, but they are very satisfying to listen to. Oh, hell yeah. You hear those impacts and you just feel it. Oh, I love it. Stage eight. Once again, we come face to face with Mr. X, now equipped with a bodyguard named Shiva. Oddly enough, Shiva fights similarly to any one of the main characters, which I found to be interesting. Hmm. And he can be pretty hard, too, if you aren't careful. Kind of similar to the Blaze Twins from the first game. Thankfully, with two players, he's not that hard to get around. And then there's Mr. X himself, rocking the same cheap moves from the first game. And by that, I mean running around at the speed of sound, just blasting away with his machine gun. Yeah, that's fair. Like before, if you're not fast enough, he can drain your lives just as easily. Fortunately though, by this point, I think you should have a fair amount of them, so even if he does get off a couple of lives, you should be pretty close to winning the fight. Hey, if I'm being honest, and I always am, I think one of the main reasons why this game was so beloved was because of just how balanced the game was in terms of difficulty. 
The game has its pockets of challenging moments, believe me, especially with a couple of bosses. But beyond that, the adventure itself isn't that hard. It's not stupid easy or anything, the enemy AI isn't just lining up to be killed. They will try to swarm around you in numbers and prevent you from fighting them efficiently, either by grabbing you from behind or hitting you in between special moves. The AI is pretty intelligent and does try to catch you off guard if you're not paying attention. And I find it interesting and fair. Because like I said at the start, all the characters have powers that make them very capable of handling the situations that they get caught in. But it's up to the player to use those special moves and get the timing down. Still, I can't recall ever getting a game over in this game. And that ain't a bad thing, but that probably is why so many people enjoyed it. It wasn't an arcade quarter eater. It wasn't trying too hard to beat the ever-living shit out of you. It was meant to be enjoyed at the home, so that even casual players who weren't fans of wasting quarters could hang and enjoy it. And the replayability came from the multiple characters, the power-ups, and probably the multiplayer. Combine that with the popping visuals, the returning music from the man Yuzo Koshiro, and the sound effects, Streets of Rage 2, much like the first game, hit a home run. The game, once again, isn't too long, and you know, kind of like Star Fox 64, it's a game I can pop in at any time and play from beginning to end within an hour's time and feel like I got some enjoyment out of it. So I totally can understand why gamers from all over give this game the praise that they give it. So yeah, with Mr. X defeated again, yeah, hooray, mission accomplished. Good work, boys. Oh, and you gotta love that ending theme. Uh, the amount of feels and the buildup it presents, the moment Axel busts open those cell doors revealing Adam is alive is one of the best moments in video game achievements that I remember as a kid, especially with the music flaring up just as the reveal happens. Every moment of it is amazing to me, and I can't get enough of it. It really is music like this that defines triumph and hits me with those waves of nostalgic memories of the days of my youth when saving the day was all in a day's work and justice was a fist to the fucking face. Yeah! As it's obvious that there, Streets of Rage 2 is an all-time classic that is not going anywhere anytime soon, and it's great to pop in for your Sega Genesis or Mega Drive at any time. But before we can move on to Streets of Rage 3, I think it is fair, not really, that we of course jump into the handheld market and check out what Streets of Rage 2 looks like on the Game Gear. Yeah, all right, you got the idea. All right, moving on. Let's talk about Streets of Rage 3 now. And boy, I've got a lot to say about this one. So yeah, Streets of Rage 3. Uh, well, let's get started. The game was created and released almost a whole two years after Streets of Rage 2, which was a little surprising, given how well the second one did, but it's probably understandable that for the third installment, they would take the series into new heights that made the overall experience even better. So how does SOR or Bare Knuckle 3 do this? Well, to summarize, the game features several changes over Streets of Rage and Streets of Rage 2, such as a more complex plot that takes a very interesting direction, and In between levels now have cutscenes with dialogue to give the story greater depth, which I gotta admit is pretty ambitious and a first for the series. There are now longer levels with more involved scenarios and uh, faster gameplay mechanics. And for an added bonus, there are a couple of hidden unlockable playable characters. Damn, based on that, it sounds like Streets of Rage 3 would be nothing but an iconic flawless masterpiece of the Sega Genesis. What could go wrong? Well, we'll get more into that, but in truth, it would be difficult to talk about this game if we stuck to one story, because Streets of Rage 3 actually had a weird development history, and depending on if you are playing the international or Japanese version, the experience will be far from the same. Fortunately, thanks to the modding community, the Japanese version of Bare Knuckle 3 has been English translated and patched. 
So for the bulk of this review, that's the one I'll primarily be focusing on. So with that out of the way, let's get started by taking a look at the third game's most ambitious addition, the story. So whereas Streets of Rage 1 and 2 would open with their games with a wall of text, giving you a general idea of the plot at large, Streets 3 opened with a cutscene. Mr. X has been defeated, but surprisingly, once again, is still alive, bigger and better than ever. In the city of Wood Oak, a devastating event occurred with a massive explosion taking place from an experimental bomb that killed over 80,000 people in the blast. She. The police force order Axel Stone and Blaze Fielding to assess the situation and find out how this nightmare happened. Adam, on the other hand, was tasked to be on a different mission entirely, but he would stay in touch. Sadly, this does mean that, once again, Adam would not be a playable character. But hey, at least he's fine and well this time. Sadly, there's also no mention of Max at all either. Hmm, I guess we can assume he's alright, I and mean, it's not like he had much reason to be a part of the madness anyway. Skate returns, however, at the request of his older brother. Or Sammy returns if you're playing the Japanese version. Tensions are high on the globe right now, with the threat of a war coming from select regions. One of the major representatives of the nations, General Ivan Petrov, was invited to the White House in the hopes of talking about peace and such. But in a surprise twist, he suddenly went missing after he arrived. Immediately after, Axel and Blaze are approached by a man named Dr. Gilbert Zan, a scientist who created the experimental bomb, Rakushin. He regales the heroes that his research was taken from him to create the weapon which has set off the chain of events. Axel and Blaze know without a doubt something is up because the timing seems just too perfect. What a coincidence. And if they don't act fast, a full-scale war will happen, which will likely result in the world's destruction. Skate joins them and heeds Dr. Zan's words that another bomb is going to go off soon if they don't act fast. The team is very hesitant on trusting Dr. Zan, but given the circumstances, they don't really have much of a choice. As the first stage begins, another cutscene shows our crew making it just in time to stop the bomb, but then an assault of thugs from the Syndicate come rushing in. What a after defeating quite a few of them, a news broadcast alerts the city that Axel Stone has betrayed them and has been claimed to be a part of the Syndicate and responsible for the kidnapping of General Petrov. Say what? The team, including Axel himself, obviously know this is complete bullshit, but they can't really imagine how it was pulled off. This is sadly the part of the story that I sort of have a problem with, guys. Up until now, the Streets of Rage games, while imaginative, for the most part were pretty grounded in reality, with the simple plot of good forces trying to fight for the peace and stopping a crime lord who just wants to rule the city with his malicious evil intent. But now? They've decided to bring some hardcore science fiction writing into the plot. Because we're dealing with cybernetic technology. Oh goody. Dr. Zan himself is a full-on cybernetic android although it's hinted he may not have always been that way. But nevertheless, one of the major parts to this plot is using cyborgs to replace elected officials to ensure a full-scale war happens between the nations. Guys, this is some major Metal Gear stuff. Nanomachine, son. <laughs> I can appreciate wanting to add more of a plot to go along with the game to give it more uh, oomph, but we can definitely say that we really jumped the shark this time. It's no deal breaker for me by any means because, hey, I do love me some Metal Gear, but it's pretty clear that we are no longer in Kansas. All right. Anyway, so the group of heroes discover Axel's doppelganger and quickly put a stop to him. As expected, it was a cyborg. Skate and Blaze have a back and forth on whether Dr. San has truly been upfront about the whole situation as they are beginning to feel he knows more than he's letting on. It does take a little while, but Zan does finally admit to them that Mr. X's Syndicate is alive and well, and the destructive attacks that they've been causing have been well orchestrated to help ensure that a full-scale war does happen so that they can sell the Rakushin experimental nuclear bombs to the opposing parties and profit big on them, with absolutely no regrets as to the potential millions of people that this will no doubt kill. War is hell. 
The team finally make their way to the Syndicate hideout, where they discover that, once again, Mr. X is there waiting for them. Mr. X tells them more or less what I told you, but adds that the real General Petrov is being held below, waiting to die from poison gas, should you fail to save him in time. Axel goes full on pissed mode and starts kicking ass. Surprise, surprise, this Mr. X was a cyborg imposter too. Meaning the real one is still out there somewhere, watching. Wasting no time, our friends storm the base trying to find General Petrov before he succumbs to the poison gas. Fortunately, we make it just in time, and they all escape the base, with Adam showing up to rescue them. Hey, he said he would be back. Adam explains that he's been tasked to locate the real base of Mr. X, and that he knows where it is and will drop us off there. But he'll also take the General to the White House, as originally planned, to try to continue their plans for peace. Axel and friends arrive on Mr. X's cyborg facility, where they bring a full frontal assault and destroy it as they move along. And finally, after a ton of fighting, the real Mr. X appears and... Oh gosh. Yep, we're serious. He is nothing but a brain in a jar now. Surviving only with the help of science. So, in a last ditch effort, X explains that even though the team has put a damper on his plans, the Syndicate has planted an insurmountable amount of Rakushin bombs across the nation, and unless he can be defeated in three minutes, whether you win or lose is not gonna matter. Thankfully, Team Bare Knuckle ain't having any of this, and with little time to spare, Mr. X is finally defeated once and for all. Our heroes escape the facility with Adam as it self-destructs, and in the end credits, it shows that all of the bombs have been dismantled, the war has been averted, Dr. Zan's been pardoned due to his help to stop Mr. X, and Axel, Blaze, Skate, and Adam all go their separate ways. And this, from what it sounded like at the time, was the conclusion of the Streets of Rage trilogy. Now, before we move on, I really do want to talk about the alternative endings to this game's story, because there's surprisingly about four of them this time around. The ending I gave you is the best case scenario and the canonical ending, but there were other, less appealing endings depending on how well you played the game. It's debatable on which one of these is technically the worst ending of all, so I'll let you guys decide. But don't worry, I of course have my own opinion. The first bad ending comes from just playing the game on the easy difficulty setting. Once you get to the Cyborg Mr. X fight and defeat him, he'll taunt the player saying that you play like a beginner and won't allow you to progress because of your lack of skill. Damn! Talk about cruel and unusual punishment. All that hard work cut short just because you decided to play the game on an easier setting. I, that'll teach you, I guess. The second worst scenario is once you defeat the Cyborg Mr. X, you have to find the General before the gas kills him. Sadly, this is not flavor text. It is very possible, and in my opinion, pretty easy to waste enough time trying to find out how to save him, which will result in you arriving too late, especially if you're a first-time player. And because you failed to save him, it's never discovered where the real Mr. X is located. However, this doesn't immediately end the game like you'd think. Instead, you are taken to a completely different final level, where you have to storm the White House and stop the fake general from doing whatever he was tasked to do. All while fighting Shiva in front of a live press conference. I'm not gonna lie, this final stage is actually really cool, and I would have liked it if they somehow worked it into the canon scenario, and it's a pretty damn epic moment to have a final fight broadcasted live in the press conference, with all these pictures flashing. While the day is sort of saved for the most part, Mr. X is still out there and never caught, so this scenario is still technically a bad ending. The worst ending, in my opinion, comes from the true final boss fight with Mr. X in the science facility during those three minutes. If you fail to defeat Mr. X in those final three minutes of the game, then, true to his word, it really didn't matter. A full-scale war was averted because of your efforts, however, the devastation from all of the Rakushin bombs left a catastrophe on the planet, the likes of which had never been seen. Honestly, the imagery here combined with the music in the background is pretty chilling, and it's one of the many things that was flat out censored from the international version of the game. Actually, now that I've brought it up, I might as well continue explaining what I mentioned earlier about this game's development history. So, Streets of Rage 3 was this time around released first in Japan, and would be released worldwide at a later date. I guess in that short time, they had gotten some reception from critics who played the game early and were interested in what they thought about it. Well, not to mention that with some of the game's design choices, the international censors had some problems with the story and visuals within the game that were going to need to be tweaked before it could get ported. 
first of all, the censors thought that the plot was entirely too dark and needed a complete rewrite. So in the true English version of the game, all references to bombs and nuclear explosions, including the opening cutscene and bad ending, were completely removed from the game. And because the nations and the threat of war were no longer part of the story, General Petrov was replaced with just the chief of police. As for the overall objective of Mr. X, it's now been dumbed down to simply him wanting to replace all the elected officials with cyborg robots just so that he could rule over the city. Yeah, they quite literally went four kids on this game's plot. But here's the thing, guys. In my honest opinion, given the time period that the game was being released, it's been argued that these changes, while substantial, might have been for the better. Considering the world was still kind of scared of the potential threat of such disasters, having a game remind them of said disasters and being marketed to kids probably wasn't the best idea. All things considered, the ambitious addition of a story at all to these degrees is still a nice bonus to what used to be a simpler plot. Sure, we stepped into a bit of Marvin the Martian science, but eh, it was still an interesting ride nonetheless. Sadly, these are not the only changes that were made to the import. The next change... Uh, I can actually understand this one. In the international version of the first stage, you will constantly see Shiva in the background dropping off thugs to assault you, until he eventually fights you himself. In the original, however, you get this. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, your eyes are not playing tricks on you, friend. We get this over-the-top, heavily stereotypical homosexual thug named Ash, complete with woman screaming sound effects. N uh, now look, I've got a sense of humor just like anybody else. Well, maybe more than most. But I've got no doubt that this probably would have heavily offended many people back in the day. Hell, it probably still offends people now. So yes, Ash was completely removed from the English version of the game. However, his coding still exists within the game cartridge itself, so if you have a Game Genie, it's still very possible to access him and even play as this character. Not sure why you would want to, but you could. Anyway, another odd change was for some reason, some artistic savant decided to change the coloring of all of the characters' outfits. But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? Axel, as we know, originally always wears a white top with blue jeans, but for, again, some reason, his iconic outfit was changed to a yellow shirt with black jeans. Blaze went from wearing her red attire to now a silver one. Skate went from yellow to red. And as for Dr. Zan, well, this is his original game anyway, so there was nothing much to change. Why they decided to change their color palettes at all, I have no idea. In truth, it doesn't hinder the game in any way, but it doesn't really add anything either. I really just don't understand why they bothered with this. My only thought was that they wanted to separate this game as far as possible from the first two in order to once again have this one stand out. Eh, it's as good a reason as any, I suppose. However, all of this is nothing compared to the worst offensive change that the developers had bestowed upon us English speakers. You see, where Bare Knuckle 3 originally released in Japan, it was apparently hit with large amounts of criticism claiming that the game was far too easy and that hard mode wasn't much tougher. So, in response to this, before they ported Streets of Rage 3 worldwide, they made a small tweak to the gameplay, and instead of balancing out the game to add a little bit more challenge, they went full-on Dante Must Die mode and cranked the difficulty up the ass to a ridiculous level. And when I say ridiculous, I am talking almost borderline unplayable. I am not kidding around here. What the hell were they thinking? Considering the short amount of time the game took to be released from one country to worldwide, it really feels like the team behind this game didn't even have time to bother playtesting Streets of Rage 3 to see what they were doing. The Japanese hard mode isn't even as tough as this game's normal mode. Hell, and you can't even finish the game if you try to play it on easy. Truly, Streets of Rage 3 feels like it was made as a punishment. Enemies are now damaged sponges that take longer to beat. More of them just keep coming to the point that being overwhelmed is the norm they hit harder, and on top of that, the stages, like I mentioned in the beginning, are much longer than usual, which was supposed to be an improvement over the last games. However, when you combine that fact with this insane difficulty, 
You've created a game that's not only frustrating, damn near impossible to beat without cheating, but it's also a grind to the point that should you get far enough, you're gonna easily get burnout of boredom just from having to fight a never-ending onslaught of enemies on a stage that really overstays its welcome. Jesus Christ, seriously guys, what the fuck? I remember a long time ago when Gene and I used my Game Genie to give us a helping hand, and the amount of times we kept groaning when more enemies just kept showing up on screen just as fast as we beat them down, we couldn't wait to stop playing. I swear to God, Streets of Rage 3, the American version, gives me some nom flashbacks. The gameplay itself does have some new features, but by and large, it does play for the most part exactly like Streets of Rage 2, complete with the same powers and movesets for each character. So I'm not going to be going over them again. But as for the new features, they added a running and dodge ability by double tapping on the directional pad, which was a nice mechanic for helping players get a move on. Additionally, they added a special attack meter as shown here. Remember those special A button attacks I mentioned in SOR2 that would drain your health upon use? Well, that still applies here, unless you have the attack meter filled up. When you use that attack, it drains the meter instead. The meter itself doesn't take long to auto refill, but it still does prevent you from spamming this attack, so I think it was a welcome addition. Sub weapons also got a little upgrade. Instead of just swinging them around like normal, some of the characters have a unique wind-up attack by doing the forward B attack with them. All except for Dr. Zan. When he picks up any weapon at all, it's converted to a ball of energy that he can use as a projectile attack. Eh, that's pretty cool, I guess. The last upgrade, which each character has, is the Blitz attack. Through gameplay, well, assuming you play well, that is, you will see these stars appear below your health gauge. And for each star you get, your forward B attack will have an extension, which is pretty satisfying to see and pull off, but sadly, good luck keeping it, as whenever you lose a life, you lose one of your stars. Eh, see the problem? The most unique addition to this game, however, was the inclusion of two optional playable characters that you can unlock through gameplay. Sadly, the game doesn't tell you about this, and without looking it up, you could go through the game never figuring it out. It's a real shame the developers this time around really got obtuse with their secrets and changes. Anyway, here's how you do it. Once you come to the end of Stage 1, you will have a rematch with Shiva from Streets of Rage 2. Upon defeating him, if you hold down B and start until the next stage begins, then should you lose all of your lives, which if you're playing the English version, trust me that won't take long, Shiva will be available as a character that you can play as. The second optional character is easier to obtain, although can be just as frustrating. Once you begin stage two, you will come across a mad circus trainer named Bruce, who's abusing a kangaroo and forcing him to fight you against its will, all while he stays in the background away from you. The idea is you want to avoid hitting Roo as much as possible and defeat Bruce instead, which can be a little tricky since he will constantly try to keep Roo between you and him. Should you defeat Bruce before Roo takes enough damage, the kangaroo will be free and decide to join your party and help you save the day by becoming a powerful, playable character. Roo is one of my favorite characters in this game, and he's, without question, just super adorable. I love Roo. So yeah, despite my problems with the localized version, I still think there are great things to like in Streets of Rage 3. The level designs are still just as great as ever, with some great visuals like in the dance club with the lighting effects. Even the environmental hazards make a return from SOR1, and you can even use those to your advantage. The levels I do think tend to overstay their welcome a bit, but I can't fault them too much with wanting to elongate a game that you would otherwise beat between 30 minutes to an hour. Like I already said, I really like the White House stage and the press conference boss room. It really is just a shame though that you have to get one of the bad endings in order to see it. Now, one of the more controversial topics that is usually frowned upon when it comes to this game is the music. Yuzo Koshiro did indeed return to do the music for this game, but like the developers, he wanted to try something different and give this game a whole different mood with a very different type of sounding music. And while I can appreciate the effort, it's no question that fans think this is definitely not his best work. It doesn't sound bad by any means, it's just that SOR 1 and 2 have very memorable tracks that felt very atmospheric and catchy. This time around, the beats feel way too fast, like you're rushing the player to get a move on. And nothing truly stands out here that compares to tracks like Go Straight or Slow Moon. Those tracks, among others from the earlier games, are just way too good. And again, while I can appreciate Yuzo being inspired to try something different with his music, this one sadly just didn't hit the mark. 
even as I'm talking to you now about it, I can't recall any tracks from Streets of Rage 3 that really got me hyped or put me in the good mood. And I think Yuzo is actually aware of this. All the same though, the man is still amazing at what he does, and he even returned among many other composers to provide a soundtrack for Streets of Rage 4 20 years later. So at the end of the day, what do I think of Streets of Rage 3? While it's no question it's never held up in the same regard as the first two entries, I don't think it's a bad game. Truly, I think the best way to play the game is to play the English patched version, as with that one you get a completely unaltered story with a difficulty that may not be too challenging sure, but the experience will still be fun. Nonetheless, suffice it to say, the worldwide localized version is clearly the weaker version by comparison, as it's just too difficult to play casually. However, the developers did surprisingly add some in-game exploits or cheats to give you an upper hand. Once again, like the other playable characters, there's nothing in-game to tell you this. But in order to do them, at the beginning of the game, if you do a required button combination or whatever you need to do for the character that you play as before the first stage begins, you can give Axel, Skate, and Dr. Zan some unbelievable powers that will actually break the game in more your favor. Like this one, with Axel being able to grand upper his fist so hard that the earth shakes around him, completely wiping out all enemies including bosses. Attacks like these are great and all, but without knowing how to activate them, most people are going to find this game an absolute nightmare to play, and will just likely put it down before long. And hey, I can't blame them. So yeah, while I do have a lot of nostalgic love for the Streets of Rage series and Streets of Rage 3, <sighs> wow, whoa. what a way to go with this one. So yes, if you do want to try out Streets of Rage 3 and you are not looking to get your ass just stomped, then... Well, you can by all means get the Game Genie, like I mentioned, and do that method, or you can play the English translated uh, version of uh, Bare Knuckle 3, because... Woo! Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Oh, man. Two Streets of Rage games to go, but I know what you're thinking. William, there's only Streets of Rage 4 after this. There weren't any more Streets of Rage games, right? Well, theoretically, yes, but... We'll find out next time, won't we? Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'm William Morris from The Brother of Gaming. Be sure to subscribe, support us any number of ways, from liking the comments... <laughs> Hold up! I mean, sharing the video, liking the video, and then going down to the comments and hating on me because I mess up I've, my videos all the time. Why am I here? Ah, who cares? We're all just trying to have fun. Anyway, guys, William Morse signing off. Till next time.